So let me kind of show you a little something real quick. We're talking, I teach the, the, the feast and festivals, if you don't know. I teach all of the Jewish customs, and that's what I'm about. You know, I love the Lord. Um, I teach Old Covenant, New Covenant, and I teach how the Old Covenant is uh, all about Jesus. And uh, God the Father is pointing to the Son, and the Son's pointing back to the Father. And these two are one. These three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are one. The Comforter was sent to us to lead us and guide us into all truth. Okay. Um, so, if you want to know where God's at right now, well then, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He moves in His feast and His festivals, which is the Hebrew word moed. M-O-E-D. M -O -E -D. Moed means to move in a circle or a cycle. 365 days in a year, 7 days in a week, 24 hours a day, bam, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never changing. That which was is that which shall be, and there's no new thing under the sun. So God operates, biblically, he says, that it's a continual, it's continual to, unto all generations. He operates in Leviticus 23 to his, through his feasts and festivals, okay? And they all point to Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Well, just like you got spring, winter, summer, fall, and it starts over again, when you really get into knowing the Word and knowing the Lord, you'll find out that in your time, you, you know, springtime, you'll come to life. And then, you know, August, you know, July, August, September is a dry season. You know, you'll be going through a dry season in your life. And come the fall, man, a cool breeze comes. Well, that's a fruit harvest. Man, you're going to start feeling good again. And then you come around December, everything's dead. You know, and people, you know, doing, you know, uh, in December, more people commit suicide than any other time. You're directly connected to the earth. You was taken from the earth. You're made up of 70% water, 30% flesh. The earth is 70% water, 30% land, directly connected. The earth's got to be baptized and be made clean, so you. So there's a lot of things, you know, that, um, you know, Paul talks about being ready in season and out of season. You're going to have in season in your life and you're going to have out of season in your life. So understanding little things like that will open up a world to you. You know, why we go through the things we go through. The fall of the year, why is it called the fall? Because that's when Adam fell. Adam fell in the fall, so it's called the fall. When he died, the trees died with it. Just little bitty things like that, biblically knowing, just opens a world up to you. We're teaching right now, we're between, we're in a spring feast. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Last week I went over and showed you how God repeated himself over and over, you know, through, you know, Passover and, and Mount Sinai. They came up out of the Red Sea on the 17th day. That's the same day Jesus came up, the 17th day of Nisan. I taught you last guy last week how between the Red Sea, Miriam did her little dance, and then they came to the waters of Meribah, then they moved on all the way to where God was, to the Mount, you know, the rock in Horeb. Before they had come there, they came to 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Remember that? Those 12 wells of water, the disciples, and Jesus in Luke 10 chose 70 other. It's, you know, Jesus said, I do the same. I only do what I see my father do. So Moses had the 70 elders and the 12 tribes. So Jesus had 70 disciples and 12 main of his source. He just repeats himself. So we understand God. He's never changing. Um, I want to bring you back to, we're between... The Feast of First Fruits, right? Tenth day, Jesus rode in. Fourteenth day, he's killed. Three days later, he's raised on the seventeenth day. So we're between the Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost. These are called 49 days, seven weeks of seven. This is actually the Feast of First Fruits. This is the end gathering of the barley harvest all the way to Pentecost, which it begins, it, uh, is where they had the wheat harvest. Very, very important. The Bible likens us unto the wheat. Wow. Can that be a clue of something? So we got to go through seven weeks of the Feast of First Fruits. The seven weeks were called the Counting of the Omer. And we're going to get into that. But before we get into that, I want to show you some pretty amazing stuff. This was showed to me. I was already walking in the power of it. Didn't, you know, never saw this before. And Sister Charlene came to me. And she said, hey, I want you to open your Bible. She said, I want to show you something in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Go to Luke 24, 49. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. I hope you have your swords with you. 
Luke 24, 49. This was, this blew me away. I mean, blew me away when she had showed me this. So, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, but we're going to talk about this. It says uh, in verse 2449, he says, uh, And behold, I send the promise of my Father to you. That's the Holy Spirit, right? Y'all with me on that. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, uh, so... We knew that he told them Jesus arose from the dead on the 17th day. He appeared to the disciples for 40 days. He said, not many days hence, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. But go wait, you know, uh, in an upper room to that you're being due with power on high. Now, I don't connected a lot of dots with you with this, that the day of Pentecost was actually the same day that God came down with the Tower of Babel. Come down and let us go see. And, you know, Moses on Mount Sinai and you know, when they went up into Jericho, that was Pentecost, when they went in to take the land. And then the 120 that was filled in the upper room. There was five that was 500 or more that was told to go wait, but only, you know, 120 stayed, 380 left. And I talked to you how God, at, at this time, you're going to have a lot of people that's going to be leaving and, you know, because, and I showed it through last week's message. If you haven't seen it, you need to go look at it because it is absolutely, His Word is amazing. His Word is amazing. And I'm only repeating what he said. That's all. It's not me, it's him. Give glory to no man. Give glory only unto the Father. You know, I'm no different than you. I'm just a servant, a part. So anyway, so right there, Luke 29, Luke 24, 49, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you receive power. We're going to see that. So the strongest strongs, right here, the strongest strongs, my Hebrew Strong's Concordance. Um, if you have a regular Strong's Concordance, it's not going to be in it. It's only going to show you, um, you know, a certain thing. Uh, um, Casey, yes, sir. come here. So, the Bible says, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. So let's, you and me together, we're going to go to Tari. And that's the, Tari is the Strong's Greek number 2523. All right, Brother Casey, this is 2523. Is this the Greek I'm in? Is that the Greek right there? Yes. Okay. I want you to read what 23, with the word tarry, when he said go wait and tarry to, in Jerusalem until you receive power. So they got to go tarry until they receive power. <laughs> what does tarry mean? Read it to me. Just a definition. Read that whole section I got right here. Right here. So it means katzo. That's the Hebrew or the Greek word katzo. To place, seat, someone, appoint, to sit down, to come to rest, to stay, to live. To sit at the right side means to be in a position of high status. To sit on the left is a lesser position. To sit on the seat of Moses means to have the capacity to interpret the law of Moses with authority. Wow. So. Wow. What did you say? Let me now. Let me read it now. So now he read it from the strong strongs. So let's see what tarry means biblically. Yes, thank you, brother. So tarry means he told them to go. It says, it says it's the Greek word katzo to place, to seat someone. So you're being seated. We're seated on the right hand of God, right? To a point to sit down. To come to rest upon, to come to rest upon, to stay, it means to live, right? Um, to sit on the right side, that's where we sit, means to be in a position of high status. You and me are in a position of high status to the Lord. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. We seated on the right. Right? And he says, to sit on the left, we know that's where the goats are at, the sheep are on the right, the goats are on the left, is, is a lesser position. That's where Judas was. He sat on the left of Jesus, John was on the right, he dipped the sop, gave it to him, and the, and the goats get, get thrown away. Right? They go to, to hell is where they go. They, watch this. 
Now what it means to tarry, it means to sit on the seat, to sit on the seat of Moses. Wow, watch. Which means to have the capacity. Now you're going to be able, what is the power that you're going to receive? The power that's going to be given means to have the capacity to be able to interpret the law of Moses with authority. Right. Wow. Is there any power now? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you do not know the law, if you don't know Moses, Psalms, and the prophets, I'm sorry about your power. What did you say? That's exactly right. That's why when Jesus came to the scribes and the Pharisees, when he came into the temple, they asked him a question about the law of Moses. And then when he answered them, they dared not ask him a question again because he gave them what the true meaning was. And it says, you know, it's, it, they said, he, man, we don't want to fool with him. He speaks as, as one having power and authority. Why? Because he could interpret the law of Moses with power and authority. Amen. That's what true, true power. That's why the disciples, after Jesus had arose from the dead and he, you know, told them to go wait till they do with power, Peter and them are preaching the gospel, and it's like, well, man, these guys ain't even learned in the scriptures. How do they know what they know? Well, Jesus was teaching them for three and a half years. Right. They understood what it was to mean, you know, power and authority. So if you don't know the old covenant, I'm sorry about your power. I'm sorry. But people, the, the power and authority comes from the illumination of you know, correctly, rightly dividing the word of truth. Like, like Timothy told Paul, uh, like, Tim, like Paul told Timothy, study the scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation. I'm sorry guys, but there was no New Testament then. Right. What scriptures did, was he commanded to study to make them wise unto salvation? The old covenant. Paul said, hey, bring my coat. Remember when he was in prison, but especially the parchments, the old covenant writings. Paul was knocked down. That's why Paul wrote 13 or 14 books in the New Testament. Why? Because he studied under the law of the feet of Gamaliel, can quote it verbatimly. It wasn't until he seen Jesus Christ receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's like, whoa, this is what it means. Hallelujah. And it's all about Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. And that's the power and the authority that Paul walked in to be able to interpret the scriptures with authority. Yeah. So if you throw out the old covenant, you missed it. Amen. You got no power and authority. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Now watch this. It means to have the capacity to be able to interpret the, uh, interpret the law of Moses with authority. The interpretation of the law of Moses is all about Jesus Christ. He wrote about me, Jesus said, right? They thought they had life in it. That was to show you you had sin, that you needed a Savior, and I'm the one that the Moses and that wrote about. Watch this. Wow. This is true firepower. That's why you try to explain something to someone who is in the New Testament, basically in the, the Western civilization church. You try to, you know, when somebody asks me a question, I'm like, well, hold on a second. I'm going to give you an answer. But, you know, I ha let me lay the groundwork to show you that maybe what you're walking in is an error. Because if what you're walking in doesn't line up with the old covenant, you're in error, 100%. You know, you don't see, you're not seeing, you're not seeing correctly. Because that which was is that which shall be, and there's no new thing under the sun. It's just concealed in the old covenant, it's revealed in the new covenant. Right. But if you're walking in something in the new covenant that doesn't line up with the old, it's error. Amen. Right. It's error. Amen. And we can get into a lot of stuff with that, but anyway, let's keep going. So, this is the Holy Ghost fire. Then when, you know, that, when the Holy Spirit came down on them on the day of Pentecost, right then, they was endued with power to do what? Preach the gospel. Right. right. Amen. Right. To go out there and preach the gospel. Now they had an understanding, because the, the, the New Covenant wasn't written yet. They had the writings, and they would take the writings and go and show Jesus in it. Look, it's Jesus! 
reveal what's right in front of me. It's Jesus. He's the Messiah. Like Nathaniel came running in John chapter 1, verse 45. It, it's, it, it's Jesus. We found the one who, who uh, Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets had spoke about. John 1, 45. That's power. Glory. What? Check this out. And then it says, remember Jesus said, for when the Holy Spirit will come, for he will not speak of himself, but he shall speak of me. John 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you about Jesus. From what? From his word. That's where the authority and the power, that's why when I start talking about the Word of God, I could tell you, I start, you know, that's why the Holy Spirit leading over, I'm sitting here and I'm reading. You want to know what those 12 stones are? You want to know what the axe head is? You want to know about what the Ark of the Covenant means? You want to know what the 10 generations from Adam to Noah is? You want to know? You want to know? You want to know? And I'm like, oh my God, son. Amen. Oh my God. And then I start telling people, man, I ain't never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's what the Holy Spirit reveals. You threw away 39, you know, books of the Old Covenant. Yeah, you know a little bit about Noah. You know a little bit about David. But their whole life story is all about Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. That's why Paul, you know, warned them, hey, be, you know, be careful, you know, the, you know, these guys that are coming in and try to lead you back into law and bondage. Right. That all just pointed to Christ. Man, the church in the West is, man, they haven't even heard power and authority yet. Because we've been taught to throw the other stuff away. Man, check this out. Let's go see. So let's read John chapter 5, verse 39. Go to John chapter 5. Go sit in the seat of Moses. That means go wait and tarry to you be in, go, to be in due with power. What is the power he's talking about? So that you can interpret the law of Moses with authority and show how Jesus Christ is the Messiah. The gospel. The good news. John chapter 5, verse 39 through 47. And we're going to read it. Let's see. Familiar passage to you guys, you know it. But check this out. Jesus himself said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. For I receive not honor from men. Don't receive honor from men. Don't receive honor. For the only one that deserves honor is Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't care who walks in that door. It doesn't matter. Amen. The only one that deserves honor is Him. Amen. We're all on the same plane. Yeah. All servants. Not, oh, it's such and such. Man, don't do it. For I receive not honor from men, but I know you, he says, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another will come in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe which receive honor of one another? That's, you know, look, I don't been all through that stuff, you know, oh, such and such, and, 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 and you know, I got him walking up to me and giving me apostle cards. And profit cards. Now give me a break. I don't need that stuff. I give honor to Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are what you are, look, it'll, you know, it'll be manifested. It'll be, but you don't have to walk around, you know. Man, leave it alone. Amen. Watch. Amen. Watch this. I am come in my Father's name, and, and verse 44, How can ye believe which receive honor of one another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, and whom you trust. The law of Moses was given to show us that we were sinners and needed a Savior. That's what it was all it was there for. But hidden in the law of Moses was Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says, For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. What? Wow. 
That's Jesus himself saying it. Now watch this. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So his writings testify of Jesus Christ. It's a witness to who he is. Don't throw the witness away. Right. That's where your power comes from. I'm going to prove to you beyond the shadow of a doubt Jesus is who he says he is. Amen. Through writings that go back thousands of years where there's no possible way he could have had his hand in it. That he is who he says he is. Although he did write it. Right. You're right. He did write it. <laughs> with the finger. With his finger. Come on. With his finger. Remember when, that, remember when they threw down the, the, the adulterous woman? Remember to him? And he says, and he showed them, and he showed them the law of Moses says that she is to be put to death. And he stooped down and wrote with his finger. Why? Because he was the one that wrote it. Amen. Amen. He was the hand on the wall. That's right. That's right. And with his finger. You think that was by any coincidence that he showed him his finger? I'm God. And I wrote it. Oh, my Lord. I remember when God showed me that. It was one of those. Ah! He asked me. He asked me. You want to know what that finger's about? Man, and all of a sudden. The Holy Spirit, bam, hits me. And what does He do? He shows me the finger is Jesus Christ. He shows me that it was with His finger. What is He going to do? He brought me back to when, when God wrote, remember? Yeah. On the commandments, the Holy Spirit taught me that He was showing His finger because in the Old Covenant, He was the one that wrote it. Right. Right. Ah! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Watch this. Hold on, we ain't even started yet. Watch this. That's true. Now, let's go. Let's go to uh, Luke. Let's go to Luke 24, verse 25 through 27. Luke 24. This is not the message. <laughs> Luke 24. <laughs> Luke 24. This is not the message. <laughs> this is the this this is the uh, the precursor. <laughs> this is how you can have the interpretation and the understanding of the message. Check this out. Luke 24:25. Then he said unto them, Jesus said, "O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken." They didn't want to receive it. He called them fools for not receiving it. Listen to what he says. He says, what did the prophet speak? Ought not Christ, verse 26, to have suffered these things and then enter into his glory? And, I like this one, the next verse, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. The scriptures are about him. You want, you want some more Jesus? Go look for him. Go look for him. Go find him. <clears throat> Go look for him. Go search for him. Amen. When the Lord showed me these things, I went crazy looking for him. Yeah. I started in Genesis chapter 1, Barichi chapter 1, in the beginning. Yeah. That's where I started looking for him. And all of a sudden, the Spirit said, okay, bam, he's here. Okay, he's here. Okay, he's here. Look at him. And I'm like, ah, ah. Son, Mama, you gotta see this. Yeah. Oh my God, son, Robbie, no, no, Robbie, Joseph, Robbie. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 Mama, I'm telling you, oh, I can't handle this. She's telling me I can't handle this. You know that Robbie, that at the time, you know, my name is Robert Joseph. Okay, so if I say Robbie or Joseph, you know, it's the same thing. My mom is calling me Robbie. You know, you know, uh, she's like Robbie, Robbie, Robbie. Just wait, I can't handle this. You know, I'm like, Mama, I got, I mean, I got to show you, look, this is not what it means. This is what it means. This is what it means. And she's like, I see it. Oh, my God. So you know what happens then? Okay. Now, now, God's got to reach in there and grab in there and like this, the physician and tear out that, take out that stuff that, that's no good. Amen. Move it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And you know what? 
care. He don't go in there with a big old, you know, trenching tool. <laughs> He's a great physician. Ever so lightly opens it up and begins to remove religion Amen. and false teaching. Amen. And you begin to let, okay, okay, Lord, I remember, Father, you teach me. You teach me. So, what was that, John? Where were we at? Oh, Luke 24, 25, it says. Luke, no, I read that one already. No, yeah, Luke 24. No, I didn't. Luke 24, yeah, I did. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It's Luke 24. Let's go to verse 44 through 49. Right over to it. 44, Luke 24, 44 through 49. You know, this is amazing because this is the Great Commission. This is the end. And you see how right here, we just read in Luke, uh, in Luke 24, 25, he's talking about Moses, right? With power and authority. Now look over here in verse 44. It's, you know, it's the Great Commission. You know, they, hey, go away. You're going to be endued with power so that you can do what? You know, to interpret the law of Moses with power and authority. And don't let anybody else, you know, deceive you. Right? So you'll know I am who I say I am. And it says, and boldly and confidently. Remember Paul's friend? He went and he was, he was changing the hearts of the Jews. He was showing them through the scripture, expounding to them how Jesus was the Messiah in Acts. Watch this right here. Let's keep reading. Oh, he says, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled. So Jesus is teaching them for three and a half years, which, were, which, which was written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Wow. It's all about him. Right? Then... Open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That word understanding right there in the Greek is the word synesis. Synesis. Synesis is a little bitty river. A bunch of little bitty rivers that flow into a massive river. So, so Jesus opened their, all of their understanding by bringing all the little rivers, Moses, Psalms, and the prophets, into the river. Ah! And they was like, oh my God, son, I understand. I get it. I'm in the waters and I'm swimming now. I'm not just walking in my ankles. <laughs> man, you got something, man. You got a river to deal with. Amen. You have a river of understanding the word of God. And how did he do that? Through the old covenant. <laughs> and don't put your hip boots on. Just get in it. <laughs> All right. Where was that? Uh, it says, Then he opened, yeah, verse 46, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are the witnesses of these things. This is the great commission. He's commissioning him and telling him you take what I've taught you the past three and a half years. You take this out. You go take it out there and you show them in this word how it's me. And you're going to have power and authority. I'm going to send you with it. No one's going to be able to stand in front of you. Because you have the understanding of what the Word of God really is. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down on him. And he said, don't worry about the things that I taught you before. He's going to bring it back to your remembrance. Amen. Amen. Ah! What's he going to bring back to your remembrance? The Word! The Word of God, Son. That's why you got to get it in you. So the Spirit can use it when you need it. Amen. When you hear false doctrine being speak, spoken, and you're like, man, it's not right. You know? Well, brother, what you think? And in gentleness, and in meekness, and in all lowliness, just, all right, Lord, how do I explain this? And let me tell you, let me bring you back to Moses. And I'll show you in the prophets how they spoke of him. How he's the one. And this is really what it means. And maybe what you're seeing and what you believe in your understanding right now. Yeah, I know you believe in Jesus, but a doctrine you're walking in 
it's not lining up with the word. All right, watch this. Let's keep going. Now, uh, go to John chapter 1, verse 45. Watch this. Read 49. Oh, 49. I'm sorry. And behold, I send the promise of my Father. Thank you. You always do me that. Thank you, Brother Tony. And he said, and behold. Now, he's talking about Moses and sending him. He says, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry. Wow. But tarry. You know what the word tarry is, right? That you sit in the seat of Moses, that you be able to interpret, you know, the law of Moses with power and authority. Go wait and tarry into Jerusalem till you receive that power so he can give you the interpretation of it until you be a do with that power from on high. You won't be able to walk in the power and authority that you need. Amen. It's more than speaking in tongues and a little fire sat on their head. Why did they speak in tongues? Do you know? Why did a fire sit on their head? Do you know? Why did a strong east wind blow? Do you know? Yeah. Because it all goes back to the very beginning. The east wind is the rock HaKadosh. And a strong east wind blew. Every time you see that east wind, it's the Holy Spirit. That was the sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to hear the sound. Right? Amen. Of a mighty Russian wind. Go look it up in Acts chapter 2. Look up wind right there. It's the Holy Spirit. Listen, it wasn't the tongues... That was the sign. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it wasn't the tongues that was the sign. In fact, the only reason they spoke in tongues that day was there were many nations scattered, you know, there. Why were there many different tongues and and why were there many different tongues and nations that were scattered that was uh, that was there? Well, it was Pentecost. They were commanded by God to be there. And remember, it was the same day in the Tower of Babel that the Holy Spirit confounded their language. Come, let us go down. That was the 50th day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit scattered them. Where now, on the day of Pentecost, He gathers them back together. Why? Because the Spirit took their tongues and separated their tongues. It takes the Holy Spirit now to give the interpretation of tongues. Well, to do one, to do what? To do one thing. To preach the gospel. It says, and they begin to hear the gospel preached in their own tongue. Okay. Amen. And what did they hear? The wonderful works of God. What was the wonderful works of God? They began to preach, repent, and be baptized for remission of sins, every one of you. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they begin to hear the gospel that Peter is now begins to, you know, talk about all of these things, what had happened in the Old Covenant, and how Christ had to die. It was so absolutely amazing that Peter, who wrote his first book, his first book, the first church he set up was in Babylon. Hold on. Let me hold on. He, Peter, was so blown away by it, and I'm gonna read it to you. I'm gonna read it to you. He knew what was going on on the day of Pentecost and why the tongues come. He knew where the language, languages were scattered. So let's see what Peter says. He writes the first letter, and he gets at his end of his letter, and he says this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. He says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us... Now, Peter wrote this letter. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ... Jesus, after that he had suffered a while, make you perfect and establish and strengthen and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He says, by Civilis, civil not, Civilis, Silas, should I say. He's verse 12. By Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying, he's written it, that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. He wrote the letter from Babylon. Why? Because what happened on the day of Pentecost, he was so pumped. He said, I gotta go where the Spirit divided all the land.
languages and set up a church because that's where it all began. He goes over there and tells them, listen brethren, remember Babylon and Nimrod where God on the day of Pentecost he had spread, you know, he, he separated the languages. Well in Jerusalem on the same day, the Holy Spirit came down and the languages are now come back together. I'm here to testify to you that where God where, where they were scattered, now they're being gathered Amen. on the same day. And let's take it a step further. Watch this. Really, to understand Peter, to see what he's really preaching here, Peter preaches to the, all the nations that are scattered abroad. Remember? That's how he starts it, Acts chapter 2. When Peter, he says, he, remember, he preached to those that were scattered. He starts his letter off like this. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cassipodea, Asia. It's the same one in Acts chapter 2. Now look down over here, he says, in verse, and in, in, go to verse 10. He says, um, let me, I'm going to read it so you don't miss it. He said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Right? Blessed be the Father of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto His lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Now he's, pre he's, he's writing this letter to all those that are scattered abroad, but he's in Babylon. And he says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though, though now for a season, if need be, you are heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, and perishes that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet you believe in, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation... Peter says, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied the grace that should uh, come unto you. They prophesied it, right? Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand that the sufferings of Christ and the glory uh, of Christ, uh, the glory that should follow. So the prophets are speaking beforehand of Christ's forecoming. Look at verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto them but unto us they did minister these things which are now reported unto you. Them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire and look into. He's talking to the nations that are scattered abroad that the Holy Spirit came down to do what? To empower them in other languages to do what? Preach the gospel. How? Through Moses and the prophets and all of those things. That's what it's there for. I don't know how I got off in that. Let's keep going. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1 through 3. We ain't got to the message yet. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1 through 3. This is the time and the season that we're in right now. So this is a word for you. Right? Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, that's Israel, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Are you thirsty for him? Yes. Well, now's the time. This is the very time he's pouring the water out right now and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessings upon thy offspring. Man, God is pouring out His water, His word for you right now. Man, 
you know, God's moving right now on people. Now, let's see. Y'all ready to get into the message now? And I wrote right here, are you thirsty for Him? Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you're really hungry and thirsty for Him, the only way you're going to get Him is that you got to go get face to face with Him. You have to open your Word and start reading so the Holy Spirit can reveal Him to you. It's the only way. You understand that? You have to spend personal time with Him. Now check this out. The message. Here's the message. This is the warm-up. Here's the message. How do we know where we're at right now? Well, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you want to know what's happening, we need to go to where God is. And this is what I wrote in my notebook. As the Lord gave me, He said, uh, I remember I telling the Lord, I said, I, uh, the ability to be able to hear God, the ability to be able to hear God, you can only hear Him, there's many ways you can hear Him, but He wants to speak to you through His Word. Yeah. Okay? So I want you to have the ability to hear Him. I said, all right, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord asks me a question. That's like a good Jew, right? <laughs> if you ask a Jew a question, he asks you a question back. Yeah. Right? So I said, all right, Lord, what's going on? He, and the Lord said to me, he said, what a question. Where am I? And I'm like, well, I know exactly where you're at. Because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. I know where to go find him. He's between the feast right now. He's appearing. This is a time of him appearing to his disciples. Wow. This is a time you can ask the Lord to appear to you. Wow. Do you know where he is? Man, to have the ability to know where he is, to go find him. Oh, well, man, yeah, I know where he's at. He's going to be here at this time. He's going to be there at this time. Because it's all in his word where he's at. When he's, you know, they talking about the bread, he shows up. I am the bread. We're talking about, you know, the light of the world. On the Feast of Dedication, he shows up. I am the light of the world. <laughs> dedication of lights. Yeah, Judas, even Judas knew where he was. Wow. Do you know where he's at? He operates the same. He operates in his feast. The spring feast and fall feast. And he says in the middle of it, between the spring feast, Rosh Hashanah, I mean, uh, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the spring feast and fall feast, look, you know, it's going to be dry for you. But there's hope you can find me. This is where I'll be. And then it's going to be dead in the winter. But there's hope because in the springtime you're going to see me again. Amen. Oh, and it's going to be dry again. Oh, and here it is. I'm coming to the fall again. And it's everything. I connected the dots last week showing you where, how you can find him and where he's at and what's going on. Exactly what happened back then is going to be going on in people's life today. That's right. Check this out. Do you know where he is? Do you know what he's thinking about right now? If I asked you what Jesus is thinking about right now, would you know? They'd be like, I don't know. Oh, I know what he's thinking about. He's thinking about Count Neoma right now. He's thinking about Pentecost is coming. What did you say? I know what he's thinking. Because I have the mind of Christ. Because he's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That's how they were all in one accord. 120 had the mind of Christ. They knew what it was about. The other 380, pff, I'm out of here. And they left. Do you know where he's staying right now? Do you know how to get to him? Do you want to spend time with him? Well, right now, the Spirit of the Lord is leading his children to him. Right now, you're not here, 
by any coincidence, you were led here. You were led. You were led. We were led here. And it's like, golly, Lord, I wish the others were here. I wish the others were here. So, 49 days between the Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost. This is going to be quick. Maybe. Between First Fruits and Pentecost. Here he is. You know, between the Feast of First Fruits, this is where the tithe comes in. You give a tithe, right? They say. I'll, I'll smash all that. I'm sorry, but, but I'm going to tell you what the real tithe is. Do you know what the real tithe is? The real tithe. All right, it's not money. Let's see. Watch this. Mind-blowing. <laughs> Remember, the Spirit said, Hey, you want to know what that is? You want to know what that is? I don't know, Lord. <laughs> Do you tell me what that really is? I might have to tell somebody and they ain't going to like me no more. <laughs> <laughs> they might kick me out the church. You're right. You're right about that. It wasn't my church. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> okay. The county of the Oma, 49 days between the Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost. This is in Leviticus 23, verse 9 through 14. Check this out. And I'm just going to... Then the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in a sheave of firstfruits of the harvest to the priest... And you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be, for you to be accepted. Leviticus what? Leviticus chapter 23 verse 9 through 14. Listen again. Listen. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the sons of Israel, and say unto them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you, and reap its harvest. Hey, God gave the law to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. For 40 years in the wilderness, they gave no tithe. They didn't enter the land yet. What did you say? They didn't even circumcise. That was the law. They didn't circumcise till they had made they received their inheritance, the promised land. What? Listen to this. He says, Then you shall bring in a sheave of first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. Wow, for you. In me to be accepted. Let's keep going. The understanding of this festival. When the standing ripe harvest of barley and wheat was ready to be reaped, one of the children of Israel, whoever, uh, whose ever field it was, would take one of the standing sheaves of his harvest and bring it to the priest. Now remember, you and I or like it into a sheaf, right? right? Remember Jacob and his dream and all the sheaves and they bow to his one sheaf? We are a sheave. Wow. Oh, shit. The lone sheaf was called the sheaf of first fruits. The priest would take it and wave it before Yahweh in his house, the temple. So at the Feast of First Fruits, you would, the ball of the harvest would come in, you would take one sheaf out your cluster, you wouldn't eat anything from it until you brought it to the priest. The priest would take your sheaf, your sheaf, wow, you sheaf, your sheaf, you sheaf, you are the sheaf. Watch. The priest would take it and wave it before Yahweh in his temple. The Hebrew word for sheaf is omer. Okay? Omer. Is omer. 
An omer is a measure of dry things containing a tenth part, a tithe. So a sheaf is an omer, which is a tenth. You with me? Oh, wait. Oh, my Lord. Passover was the barley harvest. Pentecost is the wheat harvest. Right? The tenth part of the omer represents all the people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Watch. And the omer is the measure that is taken from the gathering of the barley and wheat harvest. Whoa. Watch. So, spiritually speaking, the Bible likens us unto the barley and wheat harvest. So, 10% represents a chosen out number that has been separated from the rest. You are a chosen generation. So, let me reread that. So 10% represents a chosen out number that has been separated from the rest, like God choosing the children of Israel out of, 10%, all of the other nations as a chosen people or a sheave for himself. <laughs> <laughs> what you said? That's a remnant. That's exactly what the remnant is. <laughs> Watch. I ain't yet begun to fight, son. So, the sheave. Bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves. I mean, that's even a Baptist hymn, son. Even a Baptist bear witness to it. <laughs> Come on. Can we have some fun? Yes. yes. So a sheave represents the called out ones, which is the word. Check this out. Which is the word ecclesia. Where we get the word church. Ah, 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 son! Oh, no. I'm a she, baby! Yes. A called out portion yes. separated unto holiness for God Himself that's to be waved in His house, baby! Yes. <laughs> My God is amazing, son! <laughs> <laughs> you can take the money and throw it out the door. It ain't nothing about that. God said, I don't want your money. I want you. God said, I don't want your money. I want you. Why? Because you're a sheep. Yes. Amen. Definitely. <sighs> Golly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to prove it to you. Yes. Yeah. Come on. Come on. You want to prove it to you? Okay, let's, let me prove it to you. So, in Leviticus 23, verse 9 through 14, God says that you, that we need, uh, that a sheave is to be brought to the house of God. Now, check this out. The sheave is to be brought to the house of God. That's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9 through 14. In Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 40. In Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 40. It says that the sheave was considered to be holy. I think... Peter said, be ye holy, for I am holy, yeah. says the Lord. 1 yeah. Peter 1.16. In fact, the priest, and the Bible says that we are the kings and priests of God, the priest wore a holy mitra that said, holy, right? And separated unto the Lord on his mitra. What? 
Wow. Let's keep going. And Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says that God is honored by the sheath. We give honor to God. Amen. Yes, yes, we do. Wow. And then in Romans chapter 11, verse 16, open your Bibles. Notice how I'm going from Old Covenant to New Covenant so you understand. Yeah. And you know, only the Levites were required to take a tithe from their brethren. And we're under the line of the tribe of Ju Judah. <laughs> Judah was not commanded to take a tithe. Yeah. And there's no more temple. Amen. There you go. Check this out. Go to Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 16 says. Romans 11, verse 16 says that. Now he's talking about Israel, the Jews, and the Gentiles. Let's go to verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. That's Paul. I magnify my office. I glorify my ministry. If I by any means, if I, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy them which are of my flesh, Jews, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. There's a direct quote that Israel was the first fruits that God had chosen. The first fruits is a people, a tithe, a sheave. Right? right? Check this out. Now, go to Romans chapter 16, verse 5. Because I, I still don't believe you're quite convinced. <laughs> Romans chapter 16 and verse 5. Look what Paul says to the church. <laughs> Crazy. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epiphany. Ep what is that? Epiphanet Epiphanetus? Yeah. Who is the first fruits of Achia unto Christ? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. People, we are the tithe yeah. that's been separated wholly unto God to bring glory and honor, to be holy and separated unto Him. That's to be brought where? Where are we going? Well, I think when the Lord comes back, we're going to His house. Because He comes and does what? Gathers together His elect. The ones that have been separated. Amen. Check this out. Mm. So, the theme of the festival... So, oh, so the sheaf represents the called out ones, which is the word ekklesia, where we get the word church from. Wow. The theme of the festival of first fruits is the res is resurrection and, sh and salvation. That's what it is. Jesus arose on a, on you know on a feast of first fruits, and because he arose from the dead, that's where we get our salvation from. The good news: he died and rose again. This is the very theme that Israel teaches every year. Biblical events that happen on this day. You want to know what happened on this day? Check this out. Biblical <laughs> things that happen on the Feast of First Fruits. Noah's Ark rested on Mount Ararat in Genesis 8:4. The Ark rested. Israel crossed the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 18. Israel eats the first fruits of the promised land in Joshua chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. These are the things that happened on this day, the 17th. Watch this. The manna that God gave from heaven 
during these days in the wilderness ceased on the 16th day of Nisan after the people ate of the old corn of the land the next day which would be the 17th following was the 17th day of Nisan the day when the children of Israel ate the first fruits of the promised land now you see our promised land is we're waiting for it to come Wow we haven't received it yet so Joshua hasn't crossed us over yet or should I say Jesus hasn't crossed us over yet and 40 years in the wilderness they didn't circumcise they didn't give no tithes they didn't do none of that also the land of Israel itself check this out but even go even further also the land of Israel <laughs> man this blew me away also the land of Israel itself represents a sheave or an omer 10% of the land mass that has been separated unto God for his children until the end. Amen. Do you know it's 10% of the land mass? Wow. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> you take the original borders of Israel that God gave them. It's 10% of the entire land mass in the world. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Watch this. Biblically, remember, the land represents people and people represent the land. In fact, we're created from it. Dust you are and dust you shall return. Right? Man, do you know on the 17th day of Nisan, check this out, on this day, right here, Haman was hanged on this day. Well, Haman, his name means, hey, Satan. He put out a decree to kill the children. Look it up for yourself. Hey, man means, hey, Satan. That's literally his name meaning. And he was an ancestor of Agag, the one Samuel hacked to pieces in front of Saul. Now, can it even be more crazy? God is so absolutely amazing and so precise that, you know, Jesus, he crushed the enemy's head when he raised from the dead. That's why Haman hanged on the very same day. But you know how many sons Haman had? And Omer, ten. <laughs> ten hanged with him. A separated Haman had an Omer, a sheave, was taken from him and hanged from the gallows. God is amazing, son. So, Haman was hanged on this day with his ten sons. Haman's name means, hey, Satan. And just as Haman was defeated on the 17th day of Nisan, Jesus arose from the dead on the 17th day of Nisan and thus defeated Satan. Haman's ten sons represent the Omer or Sheaf, a tenth part of that which was destroyed and not saved. Last page. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was on the feast of first fruits. I said the feast of first fruits, we know it's called the counting of the omer. The omer is a sheaf, right? Right? 10%. The feast of first fruits. Let's check this out now. So let's now go to and read John chapter 12. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 in verse 24. John 12 verse 24 and it says now what I'm going to do is show you how we are the wheat the Bible says it plain as day you know the wheat harvest the barley harvest the fruit harvest right look what he says in 24 he says he says uh, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat. Wow, Jesus likened himself into a corn of what? Wheat. wheat. Right? Falls into the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it'll bring forth much fruit. That's like you and me. Until you die, then you ain't going to bring forth no fruit. Right? You understand that? Yeah. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16. It says, make sure I'm right, 16 through 20. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them which were asleep. Wow. The Bible says Christ the first fruits, and then, that's the barley harvest, and then. Those are His at His coming. That's the wheat harvest, Pentecost. Wow. That's when Jesus is coming. Here, I'm almost done. Jesus is the first fruits of the barley, horse, barley harvest. And Jesus also, He's the first, the first in everything. Just give you a couple of things. Not only is the first fruits of the barley harvest, Jesus is first in everything. It says in Matthew 1, 23-25, He's the firstborn of Mary. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, He's the first begotten of the Father. In Colossians 1, 15, He's the first, firstborn of every creature. In Revelations chapter 1, 5, He's the first begotten of the dead. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, He is the firstborn of many brethren. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, He's the first fruits of the resurrected ones. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, He is the beginning of creation. Amen. Like Joe would say. What would I, what would I, what, like Joe would say what? Joe, say it. I'm not what? I'm not, I'm not finished, but I quit. I'm not finished, but I quit. <laughs> we will continue the counting of the Omer and how it applies to us next week. Be blessed. <laughs> God is good, huh? God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. He is. Guys, you know, um, what you can handle, take in, and what you can't. Just put it on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's all you can do. It's a lot of stuff, but you know, when we just get down to the nuts and bolts of it, you know, God is absolutely amazing, man. He really is. God is leading people right now. Remember, they're in a transition time. They're between, you know, Egypt and Mount Sinai. So God right now is leading His children to Him. That's what He's doing. You know, so uh, he makes, you know, when he, they cross over the Red Sea, he makes the waters of Meribah that were bitter. Meribah means bitter. He made them sweet, right? They go to 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, right? The children of Israel drink and have what they need. They go a little bit further. They start thirsting again. He splits the rock at Horeb and pours the water out. But I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something, and I told the people this last week. When the children of Israel came up, you know, out of the Red Sea on the other side, they were all armed. They picked up the armor because a battle's coming. Before we receive what's on the other side. So expect a battle. You're going to be bad. You're going to have a battle coming. But stand fast and hold your ground and you're going to receive the promise of the Lord. Amen. Father, may you bless them and keep them, Father.
Lord, I thank you, Father, for your word. You deserve all glory and honor. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who reveals truth to us, Lord. Amen. And we thank you for it, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen and amen.